Welcome to This Is Real Life with Jen Blossom, where we talk all things that make us most uncomfortable. From abuse to addiction and trauma to recovery, nothing is off limits. My guests and I will expose the parts of ourselves that hold the most pain and share the freedom that is possible. This is real life. Okay, well, um, this is a very interesting day for me. I just kind of had some time. Um, Addison's homesick from school, and so I thought, you know what, maybe this is time for me to share some of my vulnerable stuff. Um, it's it's hard because. Um, I feel very despoil sharing some of this, um, but it's a part of my journey and it's a part of why I so badly wanted to start a platform like this. So um, I guess I'll start with the fact that yesterday I posted something online about narcissism and I got a lot of feedback because I think people have this weird idea of what narcissism is and they're not really, um, they kind of think that a narcissist is somebody who just really adores themselves and thinks that they're amazing. Um, and that's not actually the case. Um, and so I kind of wanted to go through my experience dealing with a narcissist And it's hard for me because I've now had no contact with this person for four years and it's heartbreaking, um, but it is just what it is. And I think that that's a part of grief. That's a part of something that is bigger than ourselves is just realizing and accepting the fact that life doesn't always go the way that we hoped it would and that our health our physical, mental, emotional, spiritual health is more important than making people like us. Um, and with that being said, I just want to make sure yeah, um, that it's recording. But that being said, I uh, wanted to share my journey um, and how scared I am right now and how I'm not even sure I'm going to even post this. But Um, I found out a few years ago, and again, my story is so complicated and has so many twists and turns that it would take so many hours to even go through everything. So I'm kind of think I'm going to start with this because I really believe it's kind of the center of all of the dysfunction in my, in my journey. Um, and that starts off with a mother who is a narcissist and, um, She actually has other issues, one being addiction and another being um, borderline personality. The scariest part is that I have blocked her from all social media, but she will still have, um, she still tries to get in my stuff. And um, I know that she's going to be very upset um, that I'm even speaking like this. And so I feel like a bad kid. Um, even to this day, even though I've had lots and lots of healing, there's still that inner child in me that is scared to death of her. So, um, when I first started talking to a therapist about my mother, I, you know, I always knew there was something weird and something not right, but I didn't know how to describe it. And my parents kept, kept us very isolated from other families. So it wasn't like there was a lot of people that I could like relate to like, Oh, well, this is weird. Like, my friend's mom doesn't act like this. Like we didn't have a lot of friends, um, which is very typical of people with personality disorders is they don't, they, uh, their image is most important, the facade. And so you, you don't want your kids to start talking because if they start talking then they pull the covers like over your perfect world that you're presenting. So, I mean, even in high school, I mean, I see people now and I'm kind of more open. Um, I didn't, 
obviously know or have a word for my family, um, but they presented very high functioning. (laughs) And I remember thinking like, I must be completely insane because no one, it's like, it's like there's an elephant sitting in the room and you're like, there's an elephant. And someone else is like, Oh, what do you want for dinner? And the other person's like, Oh my God, isn't it great? Like, and you're like, there is an elephant. Like, can no one see this elephant? And I remember like, like wanting to scream. And I mean, the minute that I would even like mention there's an elephant, everybody else shames me and guilts me. Like, um, there's no elephant or they gaslight you and say, there's no elephant or they shame you. Like, uh, you know, make, they just, they have this way of emotionally abusing you. (laughs) And so you end up stop talking about this elephant, if that makes any sense. So, um, a couple years ago, the, uh, dysfunction in my mother, um, it adversely affected my children And it was at that point I could no longer deny the addiction and the abuse um, because I think that as a child of an abuser, which I had two, my dad um, was also an alcoholic, but he died of his addiction, uh, which is really messed up too. Um, But that's a whole nother story for a whole nother day. Um, But I was absolutely emotionally neglected as a child. I was... I was tortured. I was that scapegoat child who, um, I was the reason for everybody's unhappiness. I was the reason for everybody's stress. I was, um, the reason I I was the reason for life sucking basically. And so growing up, even though, you know, they never said my life sucks because of you, it was always, um, kind of just their body posture, you know, like, um, that they wouldn't have to work if they didn't have me or, you know, I, I should just be lucky that I have a roof over my head. Um, so anyways, when I started going to therapy and I can no longer deny the dysfunction, um, because it started to impact my own children. And there's that mama bear in me that goes, you can do it to me, but you don't dare touch my kids. It was at that moment that, um, my therapist said, Hey, I think that your mom could possibly be a narcissist. And I was like, Oh, I don't see her like looking at the mirror and thinking that she's like incredibly beautiful or smart or whatever. And she said, you know, I don't, I think that that's a misconception. So because I'm always trying to figure out where I come from and why I behave the way I behave and why I'm so different, I always felt so different than everybody um, as I started reading. And which is why I am so intrigued by all things psychology and, um, addiction and trauma because I mean, I am the product of one. So I, I, one of the first books that I bought was this book called will or uh, yeah. Will I ever be enough? Good enough. Will I ever be good enough? And I thought I would kind of go through it because a narcissist. And again, I can't speak to like a narcissistic brother or a narcissistic grandfather or a narcissistic aunt, but I can speak to a narcissistic mother because I had one. And I only say that because, um, she fits the criteria. (laughs) Um, so I thought I'd kind of go through this book because it'll help me stay on track and hopefully it'll help me kind of go over everything that um, I wanted to, but it's called, um, will I ever be good enough? Healing the daughters of narcissistic mothers by Carol McBride. And you can get it on Amazon. I'm trying to show the picture of it. Okay. Um, so it's, it's important to note that a daughter of a narcissistic mother is going to have a different um, upbringing than a son of a narcissistic mother because, um, you know, a daughter and a mother are the same sex. So we kind of look up to them. And um, obviously a mother provides different things than a father does. Um, they're supposed to be more nurturing, more emotional, more... Um, Just, you know, they're supposed to be more in common with your mom when you're a daughter. And so that's why it's so painful, I think. Um, But anyways, let me just get into this. Um, um, I guess we'll start on this side. So it basically, this one is recognizing the problem and why it's so important to recognize it. Um, A highly critical mother is one of the, um, I guess, like, um, what do you call it? Like a benchmark or a check mark? Um, 
And I, I have to, I, I didn't realize how afraid I was of being criticized because she just, I mean, nothing I ever did was good enough. I mean, if I vacuumed for too long, she thought I was trying to prove something. If I didn't vacuum long enough, then I was being lazy. It's one of those things that you can't ever win, you know? Um, there's a, I love this author because she uses quotes from her, uh, I think she's a PhD, so she sees her own clients. And these are just some quotes from some clients. And one of them said, um, I'm always second guessing myself. I replay a conversation repeatedly, wondering how I could have handled it differently or just to bask in my shame. Most of the time I realize there's no logical reason for me to be embarrassed, but I still feel that way. I'm anxious about what other people think of me. Um, I struggled with anxiety and depression all my life. Of course, I didn't know that I struggled with anxiety and depression because that would have meant a parent would have had would have had to give enough crap about you to notice that you're not okay. Um, mine didn't. I didn't realize I struggled with anxiety and depression until I got married, and my husband was like, "This is not normal." And then, of course, there's an, just one more thing that is inherently wrong with me is that I'm depressed or anxious, and that was even more painful. Um, but again, um, I had to deny just, just to survive. I mean, I had to deny how painful my childhood was because what am I going to do? I didn't, I didn't have any grandparents that were around a lot. I didn't have any aunts and uncles that I could go to. I didn't have, I mean, you know, I didn't, I really didn't trust adults basically. Um, so, um, this person writes, I realize that there are mothers who are so emotionally needy and self-absorbed that they are unable to give unconditional love and emotional support to their daughters. And that was me. Um, you know, my mom would always talk about how, her, well, you have no idea what it's like and just kind of shaming me for being alive, really. And, um, and it, it was always about her. It was always about her issues and her needs and therefore I, as a daughter was always scrambling to find the right way to respond. So if mom came home in a bad mood, I needed to be the one to fix the bad mood. And as much as I tried, it was never enough. It was never good enough. So I then was an additional issue making her in a bad mood, if that makes sense. Um, so I was always trying to earn that connection, but I never could get it. There was, it was fishing in a pond with no fish, you know? So here are some, um, so the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM, describes narcissism as a personality disorder classified by nine traits that are listed below. And remember that narcissism is a spectrum disorder, which means it exists in a continuum. So you can have a few of the traits. And it's, it's important to also recognize that most people have a handful of traits. Like, you know, like in certain situations, they behave more like this and others they don't. Um, the issue is if your behavior and the way that you, um, treat people, if it becomes abusive or neglectful, that's when you definitely have to, you know, hone in on your behavior, um, and not feel so entitled to belittle or berate people, let alone children who have nowhere else to go. Um, at least if you have a friend who's a narcissist, you can tell them to F off and find a new friend. But if you have a mom that's a narcissist or a dad that's a narcissist, it's hard. Where, where are you going to go? You need them. You, you, you need them. And they, they use your need for them in order as a, a supply for their gross need of disgustingness. Um, so one of them is, um, here's one of the traits. So a grandiose sense of self or self importance. So here's an example, a mother who can talk only about herself and what she is involved in and never asks about how her daughter is. And that was exactly my mom. She didn't know my friends. She didn't, unless, unless it um, served a purpose for her. So I would find that she would ask questions or basically kind of just eavesdrop. She wouldn't ask me anything, but then she would use those to go tell her work buddies about me as if like she had a good relationship with me, if that makes any sense. Like she knows me and whatever, but she never asked me about me. Um, she's preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty. Um, so she would always talk about how much her firm needed her and how she was the best employee and she was always on time and never left early. And, you know, she was just amazing and everybody loved her. And, you know, you're thinking to yourself like, really, really? 
Um, and that's really just her grandiose sense of herself. Um, so she believes that he, he or she is special and unique and can only be understood or associated with specific people. And that's also very interesting. My mom didn't have any friends, no friends, no dinner parties, no parties, n never invited anywhere. Um, nobody else, everybody else was beneath her. Like they just were annoying to her, um, which is also really crazy. And I know that if you don't, if you have a pretty functioning, like a high functioning mother or father, this is crazy to you. And it is exactly that crazy. But when you grow up, you assume it's normal because you don't know. You don't know what you don't know. So um, the next one is they require excessive admiration. So this one, you know, she'll tell you, I never missed a soccer game of yours. Or, I never. And it was really my sister's. But she would say that I would I never miss this. I never miss that. She missed like a million other things. But something that she didn't miss, she'd make sure you, she, that you knew all about and almost make you feel bad. Like, well, I never missed this. It's almost like I'm supposed to feel bad about it, that you came to a game or something. Um, unreasonable expectations of or favorable treatment. Um, so basically they assume that they just, that societal rules don't apply to them. They just do what they want. They make a left turn when they want to make a left turn because they want to make a left turn, even though it says no left turn, that kind of thing. Um, is interpersonally ex exploitive, um, takes advantage of others. So that's exactly right. Um, my mom she only cared about or showed interest in me if it fulfilled her life, if it fulfilled her social need. So she wanted to know like what the boyfriend was doing and where he was at and kind of living vicariously through me. Um, they lacked, em they lack empathy a hundred percent. Here's an example. The mother who immediately restates any story her daughter is told, pointing out the correct way to tell it. Candace cannot really speak at all in her mother's presence without being corrected, criticized, or demeaned in some way. Number eight is often envious of others or believes that others are envious of her. Um, I always, always got that feeling that she was just, that she was jealous um, and that because of her jealousy, she was mean shows arrogance or has an attitude. Um, in severe cases, maternal narcissism um, of, of narcissism where neglect or abuse is involved, the most um, basic level of parenting care is missing. So that's basically what started for me. Um, I realized that I had the anxiety and depression because I was never nurtured. I was never emotionally cared for. And it was all generalized. It wasn't ever because of something. It was, well, now I found, you know, now I know that it was because I was completely neglected as a child. And I mean, obviously we have feelings and if your feelings aren't being met or, I mean, if your feelings aren't being, um, what do you call it? Like, when people are telling you that, yeah, you're allowed to have the feeling, like when you're just completely supposed to sub, sub, or subdue your emotions, I guess is the word. I don't know. But when you're not being told, hey, girl, I understand you're feeling like this. I would feel that way too. Validating. If, you're, if your feelings aren't validated and yet instead um, made fun of or mocked, that is so painful that you learn not to have feelings. One of the ways you do that is your body actually disassociates, which I have, I have dissociative disorders where I legit, I legit numb out and I don't even know that I'm doing it. Um, I can't remember parts of conversations. I can't remember a lot of things, um, for so many reasons, whether I'm triggered by something, whether someone says something, whether I'm feeling a certain way, I just numb out. And that's a self-preservation method, a way that I got through my life. Um, but it's not, so it's not serving me anymore as an adult. So um, this says, but a mother without compassion who fails to forge a bond with her daughter provides for her daughter only when it's the mother in the mother's best interest. Her daughter thus learns that she can't depend on her mother. She grows up apprehensive, worried about abandonment, expecting to see at every turn, which is true. Um, gr good girls are taught to ignore or deny negative feelings to conform to society and family's expectations. They are certainly discouraged from admitting negative feelings about their own mothers no daughter wants to believe that her mother is dishonest or selfish. I, I remember, I can't remember if it was through a book or through therapy, but um, if you notice all the Disney princesses, um, 
the mean people are always stepmothers or um, like the witch or whatever, but it's never like the real mom. Does that make sense? It's never your real mom is a crazy psycho and wants the worst for you, not the best, because people don't want to believe that. People honestly want to believe that you're making it up because to assume or to admit that people could actually be this cruel and this crazy is scary. Um, which is another reason why you don't tell a lot of people because no one, no one believes you. Oh, your mom loves you. No, she doesn't. If she loved me, she wouldn't behave like this. So I thought I would go through a questionnaire and then kind of give you some examples of, from my life just to kind of give you some background. So, um, questionnaire, does your mother have narcissistic traits? Again, most people do, uh, but they're not over, they're not crazy and they're not all the time and they're not in order to control or, um, abuse somebody. So number one, when you discuss your life issues with your mother, does she divert this, the discussion to talk about herself? Yes. So my mom, um, always growing up, it was, um, you have no idea how good you have it. Um, I do everything for you. Um, you know, I, if I'm tired, I'd say, Oh, I'm so tired. And she'd say, you're tired. Oh, are you kidding me? How are you tired? You know, I'm tired. I'm the one that worked all week. It's like, okay, so I can't be tired because you're tired. Like, can I just say I'm tired without it being a competition of who's more tired? Um, Number two, when you discuss your feelings with your mother, she she tries to top the feelings with her own. I mean, I remember her, you know, anytime I would say, try to stand up for myself, she would go back to, oh, well, you know what? You, you and your little feelings are nothing compared to what I had to deal with as a kid. Um, so does your mother act jealous of you? I mean, she, I don't know what else to, I mean, I don't know why else you'd be so mean. Does your mother lack empathy for your feelings? Absolutely. My boyfriend in high school cheated on me and she said, well, if you weren't such a bitch, maybe he wouldn't have cheated on you. I legit was heartbroken. I, w I didn't eat for a month. And then she had the nerve to say that about me. Perfect. Thanks, mom. You must really love me. Does your mother support only those things that you do that reflect on her as a good mother? Yeah, she only showed interest. If she could, if, if what I was doing wasn't something that she could boast about, she didn't give a shit. Have you consistently felt a lack of emotional closeness with your mother? Absolutely, because she would have to have care about my emotional needs in order for me to feel close to her. Have you consistently questioned whether or not your mother likes or loves you? Absolutely. Growing up, she never hugged me. She never kissed me. She never said I love you. She never read good uh, stories good night. She never tucked me in. She never made sure that I brushed my teeth. She never, nothing, zero. So I guess I don't question that anymore. I know because I know what love is because I have my own kids. So that's a no. Does your mother do things for you only when others can see? Absolutely. For a long time, I loved it. Christmas. I still love Christmas, but when I was a kid, it was like the best. And after unpacking this in therapy, I realized, oh my gosh, my mom would give a crap about me at Christmas time. Why? Because people were invited to the house. We would literally see family uh, once a year and they would come over and my mom would host this huge Christmas thing. And not only would she do that, but now that I think, look back, it's so crazy and insane. Everything that she bought us, she would literally lay out on the fireplace mantle so that everybody that came over could see all the things she bought. No one knows that like she didn't buy us anything throughout the year. She just bought us things at Christmas, right? There was no birthday presents. She, for my prom, I remember it was like, oh, well, that's an expensive dress, but I'll buy it for you and call it your birthday present. I mean, that was the, that was the most kind of birthday present I ever, I ever got. Um, except when I was little, when I was little, it was a big to do because people saw, right. So she would, you know, invite people and that kind of thing. But once I got older, it was like, nope, I'm not going to do that. Um, when something happens in your life, does your mom react about how it will affect her? Yes. Um, you know, when I started dating Jeremy, she was all about him because, he was on rule rules and she loved that. She loved to go tell all her friends about me dating this guy. 
she didn't really care about me or even that he was a good dude. She just cared that she was associated with someone who was a reality personality. Um, is your mother overly conscious of what others think? Yes, she is. Not really the neighbors so much because she doesn't ever go outside, but absolutely at work. Does she deny her own feelings? Probably. Does your mother blame things on you or others rather than her own responsibility? Yes, but I didn't notice that until now here I am a mom myself. Is your mother hurt easily or does she carry a grudge? Yes. She cut out her sister from her life. She cut out like literally everybody she cuts out. I think I'm the first person who's cut her out. And that's why it's probably really infuriating to her because she cuts people out. Like she literally has nobody. My dad's dad, my dad has passed away. Um, I believe that he became an alcoholic because she's so crazy to live with. You can't even live with her. She makes you completely insane. She just takes your self-worth and just spats all over it. So there's that. Um, do you feel that you were responsible for your mother's ailments, like headaches or stress? Absolutely. Why did I feel like that? Because she told me. Um, do you feel your mother's critical of you? Yes, but I didn't, but she's so beautifully manipulative that she would tell you that she wasn't critical, but in every way that she behaved, it was critical, which is very confusing. Um, do you feel your mother really knows you? Absolutely not. She, she doesn't know me at all. She doesn't know what I love, what I don't love. Um, you know, it's another story for another day, but like my dad didn't even know what grade I was in. Like they didn't know what I was studying or where I was or what I did all day. They have no, they had no idea. That's how absolutely neglectful they were. Um, you know, my mom would smile and fake it and do her sweet smiles and oh I just look at my girls aren't they beautiful oh I love my girls and me and my sister I remember would look at each other like she's never said that you were beautiful before ever and now you're saying it because these people are watching like do you mean it or not mean it that's confusing my mother is always the victim always the victim she will never take responsibility for anything I hurt her she did not hurt me if you bring up, I remember writing a letter to my parents just very vulnerably. And I mean, this was so brave. And I just said, hey, you know, I really feel that you guys aren't there for me, that you don't care about me, this and that. And they laughed at me. They, I, I called a family meeting and they laughed at me, legitimately laughed in my face and said, I can't even believe that you would assume that this is real or whatever. Like you're making all this up in your head. That's painful. Um, does your mother always have to have things her way? Well, interestingly enough, I think that my mom, so what happened was now I find out all these years later that she's also an alcoholic. So I think she likes to have things her way because she's an addict and an addict, you know, they want things their way so that they can get drunk or high whenever they want. So they're really not there anyways. Um, it's kind of cool morbid, I think, to have the addiction and a personality disorder, or maybe it's the personality disorder with the addiction, because it's so out of control, crazy. The issue with narcissistic personality disorder is they typically don't get better with age. They get worse because behavior is habitual. And if you don't think your behavior is wrong, why would you change? Hmm. It's everybody else's fault. Everybody else did it. Everybody else's. So, um, as you can assume, um, living with a mother like this is going to give you a, not a good start in terms of, uh, adulthood. You're not going to choose the right people to be your friends. You're not going to have the right foundation to build a strong foundation or to build a strong, um, marriage. Um, and you're kind of constantly not, you know, all you know is that you don't want to be like her. That's all you know. So here are the 10 stingers. Um, you find yourself constantly attempting to win your mother's love and attention and approval, but never feel like you can please her. Absolutely not. Um, I remember one Christmas I bought her a purse and she immediately went online to see if it was a knockoff. Like that's what she did. I, I was, I, I bought her a purse and she, she, want, she wanted to know if it was a knockoff, I guess. I mean, it's crazy. She, nothing was ever clean enough. Nothing was ever good enough. 
nothing was ever, you know, uh, uh, anyways, your mother emphasizes the importance of how it looks to her rather than how it feels to you. She just doesn't care. They just don't care. Um, they are jealous. So I remember kind of when I was younger, having a closer relationship with my father before the addiction. Um, I, and he was the one who played with us. My mom never played with us. She never read us a story. She never, she was the opposite of nurturing. Um, but my dad would. And I remember her picking fights with my dad, assuming that he was choosing us over her. So that's just another kind of piece of the puzzle is that her marriage, it was, he revolved around her too. There's this really cool picture. And of course, I'm probably not going to be able to find it right now, which is going to bum me out. But um, it's a, it's kind of a, a, a photo of what it looks like to have a narcissist in the family. Um, and so I'll just kind of make it up right now. But basically, it's the narcissist here. And then everybody else revolves around the narcissist. So you can't have your own feelings because you're so worried about her feelings and you can't have your own, you know, your own hobbies because how are those hobbies going to make her feel? And you don't realize how crazy that is until you get out of it and realize, I, mean, I didn't even know I had feelings. I just behaved and went along with my life. I was crawling out of my skin with anxiety and depression, but I didn't know how else to behave. Um, so she was absolutely jealous of us. She, um, a mother can feel threatened by her daughter's success. That is so funny. Yeah, she didn't even want to come to my college graduation. Um, neither her or my father wanted to be bothered with coming to the graduation ceremony. And neither of them came to my master's um, graduation ceremony. It was just, they didn't want to come. So they didn't come. So there's that. And of course, they didn't pay for school because, you know which is why I landed where I landed because I needed to find a way to pay for school. And of course I had, so here's the crappy part. I went to apply for student, um, not loans, but like grants and stuff. Um, and my parents made too much money. So, and because they claimed me on their taxes, I wasn't ever granted any of that. So there's that too. Oh, I remember, um, after I got married and I went on antidepressants and anxiety meds and stuff. And my mom, she, uh, she very much shamed me because I, she didn't need meds. Well, no, cause you're a freaking addict. And instead of taking meds and getting therapy, you're drowning yourself in vodka. Um, you know, she, uh, she never helped me with my wedding. Um, I was 22 and, um, we paid for our own wedding. Jeremy and I did. They gave us $5,000, um, and that was a very, very big deal, and I'm only divulging that because that is the honest truth. They did give us some money, but as you know, weddings cost more than that, so we had to figure out a way to pay for a wedding. Um, yeah, so they actually didn't even see uh, my wedding uh, venue, uh, didn't know what colors my wedding was. They, they legit showed up the day of my wedding. That's how, uh, involved they were. Um, she was critical and judgmental. I remember being a kid. I love to sing. I just sang my little heart out. It was something that I love to do. And anytime she heard me, she would tell me to stop that I was annoying her. I was chewing too loud. I was picking at my fingernails. It's like all these things that you do because you're anxious as a child, she would shame you for. So you were so worried about swallowing too loud or chewing gum too loud or not chewing it loud enough. You know, nothing, again, nothing was good enough for her. Um, she would talk Like she only talks to me when she has stuff going on in her life. So after my dad passed, um, I, I, I honestly thought she gave a shit. I, I legit was like, Oh my God, she like, actually, she cares about me. You know? No, it was really just a guilt trip. She had no one else to torture anymore at home. So she found me. Um, and the daughter knows that she shares traits with her father as well as her mother. So criticizing a young child's father like is like criticizing the daughter too. The daughter's needs will be allowed to depend on both parents, but when the mother shares adult concerns with her daughter, a healthy dependence becomes impossible. Therefore, my mom used to pull me into the garage and tell me how awful my dad was. Mind you, I'm like 10 years old. Um, 
And therefore I feel responsible for trying to fix the marriage. Um, I feel responsible. Like I got to tell my dad to like, stop doing this thing. Cause my mom doesn't like it. And I just want them to have a good marriage because then they, you know, I mean, then, then they won't fight. And, you know, they fought all the time and it was always passive aggressive. My mom was disgustingly passive aggressive, which is why I cannot stand people pretending things are what they aren't because it's BS. And I can't, it's like, literally, I want to cut you. <laughs> I literally can't stand it. Like, don't pretend I'm no. So passive aggressiveness, that's one of my boundaries as an adult. If I smell passive aggressiveness on your breath, you're out. We're done. There's no, there's no more. I have no more, no more, no more patience for that. So, um, this part says you may have forgotten exact events or emotional traumas, but you have likely memorized the self-defeating messages. You can silence these messages once you understand their origin and influence and work to formulate your own healthy beliefs about yourself. So, um, this is a part of recovery and that's what we talk about. We talk about recovery. So as a, as a child, there are typically, so remember everybody plays a role in the family if you're a narcissist. And of course you marry someone who you can control. You would never marry another narcissist because they would not play your game. You typically play, you know, marry someone who you can control, who you're smarter than, who you, um, you know, who's under your spell, basically. And you're a charmer, by the way. If you're a narcissist, you're a charmer. You can, people like you, you know, they, you, you know, you know how to put on a good face. So, um, but as children of a narcissistic parent, mother in this case, there is the scapegoated child, um, the one who is severely underparented and by the ignoring mother, which was me. And then there is the engulfing mother, the severely overparented. So that was my sister. And I kind of don't want to talk about that because again, this, she, she might not even agree with me and that's okay. You know, children come from the same family and have very different stories of their childhood. So, um, I would, I don't want to ever speak for her, but for me, I was the child who was the, the scapegoat, the one that everybody, the bad, the bad one, you know, um, even though I couldn't have been more good, I got all A's, I would either get A minuses or B pluses. And I realized I did that because that meant people, I wouldn't stand out. If you got too good of grades, then you were, you know, made fun of. And if you got bad grades, then you were made fun of. So you had to get like right there in that, in that middle area and, um, A minuses or B pluses. That's another thing that I tried to do so, so badly. Um, so obviously my, there was, you know, crazy things in terms of death because my parents just love denial. My grandmother died. There was no funeral for her. My, my Nana died. No, no funeral for her. My dad died. Did I just say that? Dad, grandma. I've literally never been to a funeral for a family member. And I think it's so weird. And it is because that would make, that would mean that you would have to spend your own time and your own money. Um, you know, remembering somebody and that's just too much for a narcissist. So I guess we will not have one of those. Um, so there's a couple like ways you can, they're calling them the six faces of maternal narcissism. So there's the flamboyant extrovert, the mother who is the public entertainer loved by the masses. She is the model and the artist and the actress. So then there's the accomplishment oriented. This is the one, um, what you achieve in life is paramount success depends on what you do, not who you are. There's the psychosomatic, the mother's illnesses and aches and pains. She uses those to manipulate people. The addicted mother, obviously one of mine. Um, but my mom was secretly mean. Um, and she would always say, if you only knew, you think you have it so bad. She does not want others to know that she's abusive. She usually has a public self and a private self. Daughters of the secretly mean describe their mothers as being kind, loving, and attentive when in public and abusive and abusive and cruel at home. She, she wasn't even, um, loving and attentive in public. She just wasn't mean in public. So, and then there's the, um, emotionally needy. So they are, they, they wear their emotion on their sleeve, expect their daughters to take care of them. She, um, I think now that I'm looking back, she was more emotionally needy when she was drunk. So anyways. Um, I think what's important to know is that 
they weren't born like this. They, if, if you watch the little thing that I proposed, that I posted a couple of days ago about narcissism, um, they typically had varying, uh, childhoods. So a lot of these traumatic personality disorders start in childhood. Um, there's a book called, oh geez, the boys who was raised by dogs. Let me see. The boy who was raised as a dog. And it is a um, compilation of stories from a psychotherapist. And he goes through all of these, it's a child, a child psychologist, psychotherapist. And he goes through these really crazy childhood, like abusive situations. And all these children come out of these situations with different things, whether it be schizophrenia, whether it be, um, you know, they're very sexually active because they were sexually abused, um, borderline personality, all of these things. So that's a really good one. But um, in terms of narcissism, typically the child gets accolades for one thing and then is completely neglected in another. So they become very, that's one of the theories about how a person becomes narcissistic. Um, again, no narcissist operates in a vacuum. In the next chapter, we will study some family stuff and take a look at the rest of the narcissistic um, nest. So, of course, where's the father? The father is supposed to protect the child. Instead, my father would run away. He was just happy that he wasn't the one getting the brunt of the abuse. So, instead, he threw his children under the bus. So, then if um, you said something to stand up for yourself, he would say to you, oh, look at how you made your mother feel. Um you know, kind of because then he got to be on her team. So it's really like, instead of your dad, like having your back and like getting you out of that situation, he just played the role of, you know, co-abuser because at least he wasn't getting the, the abuse you were. <clears throat> um, and again, I believe that my dad's alcohol got out of control. The more my mom's um, craziness got out of control. So um, narcissism itself causes a, por a person to swing from grandiose feelings to deep depression, almost like bipolar is a full spectrum. Disorder narcissism can range from a few traits to full blown. Maternal narcissism takes the extreme of engulfing or ignoring. We talked about that. Daughters of the narcissistic mothers seem to favor opposite ends of a continuum of life patterns. So you either become exactly like your mother or the exact opposite. And you can tell I became the exact opposite. And daughters' relationships with men tend to be either codependent or dependent. Um, another book I love is called Codependency No More. And it was a game changer because I realized how codependent I was with my mother. Again, that term is also misunderstood. So I would highly suggest you read Codependency No More by Melody Beattie. This is the, um, this is the picture, the mother's self-absorption. Okay, the family secret. I don't know if you can see this. Darn it. No, you can't, but it's on page 71 of the book. And it's basically how the mother's on the inside of the, of the um, family tree and that everybody else revolves around it. So instead of the mother talking to the daughter, the mother may express her thoughts and feelings, usually negative and criticizing to another family member in the hope that he or she will tell the daughter. So she would all, she would always, um, talk with my, um, my sister or my dad about me and then kind of. It was almost like she was gossiping about me behind my back. Um, it was a very much a betrayal and it was very, very painful. So, um, yeah, the most gracious. So she was generous. The image is everything. Um, and yeah, I think I can probably stop there. Um, but it absolutely affects your entire life because your childhood is, you know, where you learn everything you need to learn for the rest of your life. And so you have this inner child that's deeply wounded. And even though your adolescent, you know, years might have looked different, or your adulthood might have looked different, you still have parts of you that aren't healed. And emotionally, you know, if you're not caught up emotionally, your spiritual self, your physical self, your mental self are not all going to be on par either. Um, so you really need to find healing. And the only way to find healing is to, you know, first of all, you have to become aware, right? This is all the parts of, you know, getting better. You have to become aware. You have to do research. You have to listen to things. You have to find people that are safe. Um, yeah. So I think that I'm so glad I actually did this. I'm feeling a lot better about it. Um, again, that inner child in me is feeling guilty that um, I'm betraying her. Um, 
But again, this is a part of my healing um, and my honesty. And again, I think if you don't want to be portrayed as a narcissist, then don't behave like one. Just like if you don't want to be called a rapist, don't rape. Um, if you don't want to be called a molester, don't molest, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm not like making this up. This is all true stuff. And I hope that by me kind of diving into this a little bit, it'll help understand the rest of my story because I think it all begins with, you know, for me, my story, my very long story begins with this, this unsafe place um, that was supposed to be a home that was supposed to be shelter from the outside world ended up being the biggest source of torment. And I don't even know if I can describe how awful it is because this was not a one-time thing or a two-time thing. This was every single day. So that is how you become diagnosed with complex PTSD. PTSD is basically, you know, maybe a short amount of time where there's different issues going on. Um, that's why in war, you know, people come home with PTSD. Um, but complex PTSD is when you are abused over and over and over again, um, especially when you're gaslighted and being told that you're not being abused. Um, it's a really hard thing to overcome. So my hope is that this podcast sheds a light on all types of abuse, on all types of trauma, because there is help out there. I cut off all relationship with her four years ago, and I have got to tell you the anxiety and the depression the past three years have been better than I've ever been in my whole life. Um, that is a physical response to not being around somebody that creates so much chaos and trauma and pain in your life. So not that the first year was not hard. That was the worst year of my life because I had to grieve the mom I never had. And I had to come to terms with the pain of, um, all of the things that I thought were right. So, but you kind of don't want to believe that they're right. You want to live in the denial because at least that means your mom loves you. Um, and when you find out that she doesn't, it's really hard that um, she's incapable of love. And that is in no part a reflection of me. I hope this was um, something that is was educational. And I hope that this is something that you can learn from. And if you have questions or comments, I would love for you to comment or question. Um, again, I have so many more resources that I could go over, but I thought this was a really cool way to, and succinct way for me to kind of describe um, where I've come from. So with that being said, I hope you guys enjoy your day and that you're brave. I hope that you find hope and community and love and recovery and all the good stuff. All right, all my love.